We're coming near the end of a, of a lengthy series called For, uh, uh, Friendship, Why Friendship Matters, side by side, I'm trying to remember my own sermon series title. And we, uh, we've been talking about friendship like a diamond, uh, looking at it from different angles. And now we come to the story of Jesus' resurrection again, the account in John's Gospel, where there's a beautiful, intimate portrait, a meeting between Jesus and and Mary Magdalene. And I want to read that from John chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. But first, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your presence with us here, your risen presence in this place of worship and around the world as we come together united in praise and thanks for all you have done for us, your victory for us over life and death, and your presence now with us by the Holy Spirit. Speak to us again afresh through your word to each of our hearts, just exactly what we need to hear this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. From John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. And now I'm moving down to verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was him. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking that he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, meaning teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. I love this passage. I love this intimate picture that we have that's so characteristic, too, of John's gospel. These one-to-one encounters between Jesus and now, in particular, Jesus' appearance, his first appearance to Mary Magdalene. But beyond that, it teaches us that what is possible as we come to know Jesus uh, in the encounter with Mary is also possible for you and for me. The possibility that we can live in a circle of friendship with God that lasts forever. And I want us to think about that this morning. And ask you to consider a couple of things as we, can, as we meditate on this passage this morning. And the first is this, that as our forever friend, Jesus responds to our grief with compassion. That as our forever friend, Jesus responds to our grief with compassion. Mary was one of Jesus' very closest friends, one of his closest disciples. She was from Magdala which I had the opportunity to visit with our Holy Land pilgrimage in 2018. A beautiful town at that time. Every house was tiled, which probably means it was a very wealthy city, which makes a lot of sense. We think Mary Magdalene was actually a patron of Jesus, that she was able to help support him uh, in his ministry as other women, as Luke also tells us. Magdala is only six miles from Capernaum. It's uh, very near the center of Jesus' activity in the Sea of Galilee. And it's almost certain that Jesus visited 
uh, Magdala and preached there. In fact, the oldest synagogue ever discovered in Galilee is in Magdala, and you can see it with your own eyes. You can actually see the stone floor, the original stone floor of that synagogue where Jesus most likely stood. I know when I was there, I was deeply moved. I felt that Jesus had been there. The Gospels tell us that Jesus cured Mary of a severe illness and that she became his follower along with several other notable women. There are two groups that are described who followed Jesus. A group of men, and Peter, the apostle, was most likely the leader of them, and also a group of women, most likely led by Mary Magdalene. Now, we hear a lot about the men in the Gospels. After all, it is a patriarchal culture in which it was written. But there was a lot going on among the women as well. And we know this. Even in the culture of that time, the women are so prominent beside Jesus at his crucifixion and the first to see him risen from the grave. And all of the Gospels agree that they were the first to witness that event. What we know is that, as I said, they supported him financially, they accompanied him on the road, and they played a major role in Jesus' ministry. John records that when Jesus speaks to Mary, she doesn't recognize him. She mistakes him for the gardener through her tears. But Jesus' question, woman, why are you weeping? Why are you crying? implies that he saw her grief and that he felt compassion for her in that moment. One of the most profound questions that we can ask at human beings, and it's a question that I'm asked often, actually, as a pastor, is how can a loving God allow so much crying and so much weeping in this world? How can a loving God allow suffering As we think about all the lives lost to COVID-19, or we think about the war in Ukraine, or we think about our own reasons for grief, I doubt there's anyone here who hasn't experienced those deep, deep questions. Why God? Why? Why do you allow those things to happen? We know you're good. We know you're loving. Couldn't you have made a world in which nothing bad could ever happen? Couldn't you have made a world in which Every disease was instantly cured, and nobody could fall and injure their knee. Why, God? The Gospels respond to this question of suffering in a very unique way. They don't give us a pat answer. They don't give us a lot of answers. They give us the answerer. They don't give us a lot of words, but they present us with the living word. They point us to the God who suffered with us and for us in the mystery of the cross. So at the very center of our faith as Christians, this question of suffering is addressed in God's personal experience of suffering with us in Christ, which means so many things. But at the very least, it means that there is no place so terrible, so dark, so lonely, so despairing that God cannot reach us with his redeeming love. He's been there. But just as no friendship can be forced, we also need to welcome Jesus' sincere offer of friendship in all the crises and trials and troubles of our lives He won't force his friendship upon us. He invites us to welcome it with open arms, to welcome him with open arms. And so we want to go on to say that as our forever friend, Jesus invites us to turn to the one who made us and knows us by name. The fact that Jesus called the weeping Mary by name is so important. So important. Mary, he says. Because it means that he not only had compassion for her, it means that he knew her. He knew her. You can have compassion for a lot of things and a lot of people and not know much about them. But Jesus knew Mary. He knew her. 
He loved her. He cherished her as his beloved friend. In the episodic TV show about Jesus' life called The Chosen, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but I do recommend it, and I've mentioned it before. The writers fill in some of Mary's history, and it, they suggest that Mary was, was assaulted by a Roman soldier years ago, and that she was also abused by her father. She suffered from terrible nightmares and delusions, and we learn that she even takes on another name, Lilith. She, she no longer is called by the name Mary. But she begins to be um, more and more lost and sad and fragmented. And she's trapped inside her own self, as if, even as if she's possessed by some evil presence. you know. And in that dark place, Jesus meets her. Another rabbi, though, tries to heal her first, and she's, he's unsuccessful. And then in this beautiful scene, Jesus meets her in this tavern. She's about to take a drink, and he places his hand on her wrist, and she winces as if she's in pain, almost. As though something within her is resisting Jesus' presence and runs out of the tavern. And now I want to show you a scene of what happens next from The Chosen. Leave me alone. Mary. Mary of Magdala. says the Lord who created you and he who formed you. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Love that scene. The the uh, the writer had Jesus quoting from Isaiah 43, 1 as she's as he's coming to Mary. Mary, do not fear, for the one who has created you, who has formed you, who has called you by name. I have called you by name, and you are mine. I love that. How do you my, know my name? Mary asks. And more than anything, we want to be known and loved, don't we? We want to be known. And ultimately, we want to be known and we want to be loved by God. The Lord knows us by name. And the Lord also knows the name of the burden of that thing that we're carrying right now. That shadow that hangs over us. The Lord knows that too. And wants to touch us with his love and heal us in so many different ways. So many ways that God brings his healing to us today. I've experienced that in my own life. Mary heard her name again on that Easter morning and turned toward that voice and said simply, Rabbi, teacher. In that moment, she knew, as we can know, that there's a reality, that there's a someone who loves us beyond words, that can give us victory over meaninglessness and despair and death, and fill us with faith and hope and love. And finally, as our forever friend, Jesus chooses us for each other and his mission. 
when Jesus told Mary not to hold on to him, it's not because he couldn't be touched, but because he had a special assignment for her. Friendship, as C.S. Lewis said, is always about something, about a favorite hobby or a common cause or a sacred mission. Jesus, when Jesus calls us to be his friends, he calls us to believe in him, to tell others about him, to join his healing work in the world. There's so many ways that the Lord brings healing through his people. So many ways that God uses us to bring the good news of Jesus' love and power to those around us and and do his healing work. And he says, go tell my brothers what just happened. It never ceases to amaze me that Jesus continued to speak of his disciples as his friends, not as traitors, not as those who had deserted him when he was most in need, but as a reminder of his grace and the power of his sacrifice for us on the cross to deliver us from all of our sins and to reunite us to God and to each other, not for a year, not for a lifetime, but forever. I want you to look around you today and just consider the possibility that these are your friends, not just for a year, not just for a lifetime, but forever. Think about that. Paul says that the wages of sin is death. It's a dead end. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And he came to give us life here and to give us life there forever. We may think that it was our idea to be here today, but for Jesus' followers, there are, strictly speaking, no accidental meetings No accidental conversations. You did not choose me, Jesus said in another place in John's gospel, but I chose you. You and I are here today because the Lord has invited us to be here and to join the circle of God's forever friendship. Jesus won't force anyone to be his disciple or his friend. He's given us the power to choose, and isn't that an amazing thing? We have the power, the freedom to choose. And so knowing that the Lord invites you, just as he invited Mary on that first Easter, how will you answer him? How will you answer? What's the burden that you're carrying? What's the fear that you hold? Where are the places that we are running from God and from other people? The Lord invites us to come to this place and to welcome his love and his friendship and his healing work in our lives. Let's spend a moment of silence as we consider that in prayer. And this music that you'll hear at the end of this silent meditation is the music of Bill Augustine. In just a moment, we're going to say a closing prayer. Uh, Actually, I think that prayer is on for right now. Do we have that prayer up? 
All right. I want to invite us to pray this prayer, and then we're going to sing a final hymn. And I think this is a prayer that we could say in response to Jesus' invitation today. Risen Lord, you said, come. I'm the one who created you, who redeemed you. I've called you by name, and you are mine. So now I say to you, Lord Jesus, you have created me. You have redeemed me by your blood on the cross from all my sins. You rose from the grave to be my Lord and my Savior. As you have called me by name, so now I call upon your name, saying, Lord Jesus, I am yours. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit, that I may faithfully serve you with your other disciples forever and always. Amen. You know, I just invite you to 